Good morning, everybody. Uh, I was asked to talk about a topic that has um, become very popular in the lay media. Um, <clears throat> there's hardly a week going by where there's not some article or podcast about gut health and its relationship to the microbiome. I'll try to give you a bird eyes view of this topic without really getting too much in the details of an evolving and very complex uh, interaction. Um, some disclosures, none of which really are related to the content that I'm um, presenting to you. So as a gastroenterologist, we know a lot about specific microbes and gut diseases. That's what we're trained in. Um, endoscopy is <clears throat> the way to make these uh, diagnoses. And uh, um, what we're dealing with on the left side, you see an, um, a gastric ulcer with H. pylori as a single organism. On the right side, you see um, um, a uh, infectious um, enteritis. Now, typically, these are uh, characterized by endoscopically detectable lesions. Um, generally, there's a single pathogen involved, uh, which is well studied in terms of its mechanisms. There's an acute pathology with inflammation um, um, and often ulcers or erosions. And the symptoms are typically limited to the gut other than um, sort of general symptoms of fatigue and uh, not feeling well. So it's a very different situation when we talk about um, issues that are related to, um, to the gut microbiome. So a normally normal appearing gut is characteristic. Um, it's typically a chronic dysbiosis associated with this, uh, with this image. Um, and often there are widespread symptoms affecting many organs of the body, which I will um, illustrate uh, throughout my talk. So if we could look through the wall of the gut, um, which looks normal to the outside, uh, we'll see obviously um, a very complex system. Um, it's been referred to as the gut connectome, which is made up of the um, millions of uh, nerve cells, the enteric nervous system. Um, it's also made up of immune cells, um, and it's, it's made up of um, um, endocrine cells uh, and enterochromaffin cells that contain uh, neurotransmitters and, and hormones. All these systems in the gut, um, just microns under the uh, um, epithelial layer, are interacting with each other and have been referred to as uh, the gut connectome because they really function as an integrated unit. So the coordinated interactions of these multiple cell types, all of which have the ability to communicate with each other and beyond the gut, um, they interact also with the um, microorganisms in the lumen, the, the microbiome, um, and set up a, a, a very complex system that can lead to major dysregulations of motility, um, but also uh, secretion, uh, uh, blood flow. Um, but as I said before, going way beyond um, the, the gut lining. Talking about the microbiome, uh, everybody knows there is um, trillions of microbes living in our gut, the majority in the distal small intestine and um, in the colon, the large intestine. What's really most interesting is that um, we humans have about 20,000 genes um, and that's um, really a very small amount compared to the microbial genes that have been uh, identified in um, in, in the microbiome, uh, which goes into the millions. And so since on this, on this graph, it's represented the red line, the red contour of this body uh, image makes up the human genes and all the rest is basically microbial genes. And it's interesting that we have been able to write textbooks of medicine and uh, perform therapies and diagnosis uh, while neglecting 99% of this very complex system. 
the majority of these genes, we don't even know their function, which makes it even more interesting. So the microbes and their genes are able to produce a large number of um, um, uh, signaling molecules, uh, metabolites. Many of them are generated from the food that we eat. Not all of them. Some are also generated from um, molecules that the body produces, like bile acids, um, uh, sex uh, hormones. And these, these hundreds of thousands of metabolites um, interact with each other, but they essentially uh, can affect every system within the body, including the brain. Um, and particularly relevant have an important influence on the immune system, starting with the gut associated immune system and going beyond to other um, areas of the body where uh, immune cells are located. So before going deeper into the um, interactions of the microbiome with the immune system, let me just illustrate one example of um, what, what we've learned about metabolites that are generated from um, from food components. So essential amino acid, tryptophan, which um, has been particularly well studied in terms of, initially in terms of um, the serotonin production, uh, the microbes play a major role in stimulating these enterochromaffin cells in our gut lining, the main warehouses of serotonin um, to, um, to synthesize and to release serotonin. Um, which then can be released on, um, um, on the basal lateral side on synapse-like structures with interacting with the vagus nerve and, and signaling directly into um, um, emotion regulation and homeostatic centers within the brain. What's interesting is so serotonin stored in these cells is also released into the gut lumen and acts on um, some of the microbes. And it's been shown that some of these microbes actually have a molecule that's very similar to the serotonin transporter, uh, the same molecule that's also located on, on nerve cells, which regulates the reuptake of serotonin. So the microbes can close their role in stimulating serotonin, but also uh, are influenced by the released serotonin in their behavior. And we don't know exactly what behaviors are uh, regulated by this um, luminal serotonin. Now, this is just one of the tryptophan metabolites that uh, involves the microbes. Another one is kynurinin. Um, many of you probably have never heard of this. Um, it's also a very important sub substance whereas serotonin is really um, beneficial for many of our vital functions such as sleep and appetite and overall well-being. Um, canuronine is uh, a molecule that's been involved in, in neurodegeneration and neuroinflammation. And um, the ratio of um, tryptophan that's being transformed into either serotonin or into canuronine is also influenced significantly by certain microbes such as the lactobacilli. We won't get into the details of the mechanisms. And then there's a third candidate, a third component, which are the indoles. And the indoles are actually produced only exclusively by the microbes because the microbes are the only ones that have a, the, uh, the enzyme to um, metabolize uh, tryptophan to indoles. And the indole metabolites, uh, like this indoxysulfate, have been implicated in many brain disorders, autism spectrum disorders, and autism um, and um, um, Alzheimer's disease, um, and uh, are, are certainly a well-studied um, uh, aspect now of um, microbiome brain communication. So this is just one um, essential amino acids. So just think about the, the, the thousands of components that are in food that are processed by the microbes um, in similar um, analogous ways, um, releasing substances that regulate uh, the feedback to us, to the host, and regulate our gut function and also our um, functions of our organs. So for the rest of the talk, I'll really focus on the immune um, effects of um, the, the, the microbiome. 
so these terms is kind of interesting. Um, a, a lot of these terms are have surfaced in the um, in the lay media. Um, so this concept of the leaky gut, I still remember, you know, more than 10 years ago, some patients came to me with that term um, from the functional medicine practitioners, which I really couldn't, you know, make any sense of. In the meantime, we actually, this has been used by scientists as well. And just giving an idea of the interaction of the microbiome with the, with the systems in the gut, um, that ultimately lead to various um, diseases, including gut health. So we have a diverse, in a healthy gut, we have a diverse microbiome made up of a large number uh, and, and a, a very diverse number of, um, of individual uh, microbial taxa. Uh, these, this luminal microbiome is separated from, is isolated from the epithelial layer by a competent mucus layer complex mucus layer, which is produced by specialized like guarded cells in, in, the, in, in, in the gut in response to the action of certain microbes. And um, in this situation, dendritic cells that have their extensions sticking into the gut lumen uh, and sensing uh, will not come in direct contact with the surface um, um, membrane of, of any of the microbes. So this is characterized, um, this situation would be seen in somebody who is on a healthy diet, comp rich in complex carbohydrates, high in fiber, high, as I said, high mi gut microbiome diversity, abundance of mucus stimulating microorganisms. And this, is, uh, this particular taxa has been shown repeatedly, Prevotella, um, to be abundant in this situation. And this results in an intact gut barrier. Now, what happens with um, chronic stress, um, but also with the Western diet, um, is a significant change, as you can see here. So Western diets or standard American diet, uh, refined carbohydrates, refined sugars, high in fat, low in fiber, um, decreased fiber degradation, a decreased gut microbiome diversity and richness, decreased abundance of mucus stimulating microorganisms and decreased Provotella abundance, which has been shown uh, in, in many studies now. This is associated with a decreased mucus thickness. Um, and now you can see that these um, extensions of the dendritic cells, these immune sensors come in direct contact with um, the membrane of certain microbes, particularly the gram negative ones with the lipopolysaccharide in, in, in these membranes and lead to an activation of the immune system. This in turn can lead to a dec um, decrease in the integrity of the, um, the gap junctions um, making up the intestinal, the uh, epithelial barrier with uh, microbes actually getting into the Gut associated, gut associated immune system further stimulating the immune system. Now the state that results from this interaction of the benign microbes with the immune system is called metabolic endotoxemia. So it is a endotoxemia without an infection um, um, related to uh, you know, dietary factors. But as I said, also chronic stress can do something very similar. Um, and this has become, turned out to be a major, I would say almost universal risk factor for a variety of our common chronic diseases. Um, and one factor that, so listed here, and I'll come back to these as um, again in the subsequent talks. Now, not everybody who has that, you almost have to assume that about 40% of people that, um, that are overweight, obese, or have, um, uh, the, the metabolic syndrome uh, in the American population um, will have this to a certain degree, but depending on the, the genetic risk, um, different diseases can arise from that, um, from, from, from this um, uh, influence. So let me show this in a, in a little different framework. Um, so many of these diseases, um, these, um, chronic non-infectious diseases, we're really in the middle of an epidemic of them. We don't talk about it because we have medication to um, prevent mortality from it. Um, 
So just to give one example that uh, that the majority of people over 60 would meet the criteria for a statin, indicating that they all have to a certain degree this, uh, this abnormal state. So why do we have that? Um, coming back, well, um, and, and, and why have these diseases increased in the last 75 years? Uh, coming back to this basic interaction of the gut microbiome with the with the gut connectome here. And so these are the things that have happened, um, changes in lifestyle. And I would say all this can be identified in the last 75 years or so um, with an accelerating pace, um, changes in early colonization of the gut microbes, uh, and then medical practices in particular, um, increasing hygiene and the excessive use of antibiotics, particularly in infancy and uh, childhood leading to a state of dysbiosis, dysregulation of the normal composition. Um, and this ultimately has resulted in um, the stimulation of inflammatory um, mediators, cytokines, um, lipopolysaccharides in the circulation. So why is this happening? Um, we know, uh, so this is one theory about it. Um, the microbiome, um, one of its abilities is this rapid adaptation to uh, environmental changes in the relative abundances, diversity of function. It's much more adaptable than um, our, our bodies and, and our gut. Um, and this is very related to the fact that there's, this, as I mentioned earlier, these 2 million genes and epigenetic influences. So the gut itself is much slower to adapt. Um, it's been um, estimated that genetic changes in the gut happens a, in adaptation to the environment every 10,000 to 15,000 years. Um, and that's probably due to the much smaller number of um, genes and, and the capability of, of rapid adaptation. So this mismatch between the dramatically changed microbiome and the um, much less uh, altered um, um, gut connectome that has not had, had a chance to adapt to these changes leads to this immune system activation and metabolic endotoxemia. And this is unique. This has never happened in evolution. Um, most of the changes that have happened over time, dietary-wise, have really happened in more in the time frame of these, um, you know, 10, 15,000 years or even slower. So, and then this is the end result. So we have this immune activation, and it doesn't stay in the gut, even though um, you know it has been associated with um, with colon cancer um, risk, um, um, with um, fatty liver various brain disorders, pulmonary disorders. It is interesting that almost all these, as I said now a couple of times before, all the chronic diseases that we're dealing with, grappling with today, are related in some ways to a similar mechanism. So this is something that um, we have sort of forgotten over the, the seriousness of the pandemic. We are in the middle of an epidemic of these chronic diseases in, um, developed and developing countries. The, the most interesting thing is that these seemingly um, totally unrelated disorders are all um, co-occur cool with a higher frequency than by chance. Um, and for example, metabolic syndrome increases the risk for most of the others, um, um, including cardiovascular disease, depression, autism spectrum, um, and, and fatty liver disease. So this is something I think is, has not been taken as serious. It's obviously um, a, um, a rich marketplace for the pharmaceutical industry because they have been able to contain uh, or even reduce the mortality rate um, from these various diseases, even though they keep increasing in, in prevalence. So in summary, um, after this whirlwind tour through gut health and the role of the microbiome and the widespread implications this has for our health. Um, a healthy gut microbiome is essential for a healthy gut. Various lifestyle factors and medications, in particular diet, chronic stress, and antibiotics can negatively affect the gut microbiome. 
A mismatch between the ultra microbiome and the gut results in aberrant immune system activation with widespread effects on the body. And genetic predispositions determine the specific disease manifestations of this metabolic toxemia. So um, I can't stop this talk without doing some PR for my um, upcoming book, The Gut Immune Connection, where it really focused on this uh, topic of this short presentation, The Gut Immune Connection. And if you want to learn more about this or even better, pre-order this book, um, you can see the information here. Thank you very much for your attention.